Welcome back to our first session of the afternoon. I have the pleasure of introducing you to Patricia Boyle. You will read all about her in your program pamphlet, but what I would just like to add is that she's been a, a welcome addition to our NCHAP team because of her expertise in studying cognition. And one of the big things that scares a lot of older people is that cognition starts slipping and you worry that you're, you're losing your capacities. And, and in fact, that may happen, but what I like about Patricia's work is she looks at protective factors. How can you stave off that decline? And I think taking a positive angle towards aging is a form of healthy aging. And so I'm looking forward to hearing from her, Patricia. Thank you, Louise, for the um, generous welcome. And I'd like to thank Linda and the conference organizers for the invitation to be here today. It's been a fabulous conference so far. Um, I was listening to Maureen this morning and you know, thinking that he, Linda had asked me to present on healthy cognitive aging. What is it and how do we get there? But I think Maureen really probably should be giving this presentation. After learning more about you, I think you've figured it out. Um, so when we think, oh, this is not forwarding. Oh, there's so, a, oh it doesn't work. You have to press the, the, Oh, this, okay. This. There's a little window that pops up. You can get rid of it. Sorry. Oh, we had this figured, huh? Yeah, she just was doing, you were just doing it with this. Pointer problems. Oh, there. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So when we think about cognitive aging in general, right, we like to think that we're all going to be like Maureen, right? We're going to age well over time without showing evidence of cognitive decline or impairment. We, we think that as we get older, we gain life experiences, we gain more exposure to different people, different information, we should be able to continue learning and we should be able to use our brains efficiently. And of course, this is the goal. This is why we're all here today, is to think about what can we do to promote healthy cognitive aging within our own lives and within society more broadly. Now, unfortunately, we, uh, we do know that a sizable number of people will cross over during the aging process into a state of cognitive and functional disability, where they have significant memory and other thinking problems, difficulty taking care of themselves, performing what we call activities of daily living, feeding, self-care, bathing, and so on. And dementia currently affects around 6 million older adult Americans. This is a major problem for older adults. As Louise mentioned, it's, it's one of the most feared consequences of aging. But we also know that there's another segment of people, this red line here, who will develop milder forms of thinking problems. So they may have some difficulty with memory, for example, or maybe attention. These difficulties aren't enough to cause them really impairment in terms of their ability to take care of themselves, but they can be disconcerting for the individual and their family member, and they are problematic. Uh, we know that many more people have these mild thinking problems. This is a, a cognitive stage now known as mild cognitive impairment. And there are a lot of people floating around who are struggling with these issues, but not yet really severe enough to come to the attention of the healthcare system. So, so really these people are in sort of a middle ground where things are a little bit tricky. Now I show you this model of cognitive aging, because it sort of provides a simple view of what cognitive aging could look like, sort of three classes, someone who's doing well that group, a group that has some minimal problems, but nothing horrible, and then the dementia group where people are really struggling. And this is a nice, simple way to think about cognitive aging. But in reality, this is what cognitive aging looks like. So what I'm showing you here is a whole bunch of different individuals' cognitive function measured over 15 years and followed over time. Each line represents a line for one person who we followed their cognition every year and then plotted that line over time. So you can see, for example, here, 
you have this top blue line. This probably is like Maureen. This person comes in functioning pretty highly, maintains their cognition throughout their aging span. But then we have other people that come in and really just tank some sharp lines. These people are just on their trajectory downward, oftentimes toward death, and then everything in between. And essentially, when we think about cognitive aging and healthy cognitive aging in particular, what we're really asking is what separates this person from somebody who comes in and has this more severe or even more moderate decline? What is the thing that keeps that person up at the top? And how do we get more of us looking like that person? Certainly, we know with cognitive aging that much of the decline we see does follow the dementia diagnosis. So if we consider cognitive change, again, this being a group of people's cognitive change over time, we see, oh, sorry, we see that most of the cognitive change and decline, it does really happen after a dementia diagnosis. So when that diagnosis comes on board, that means that person's really past a tipping point and they're gonna be trending downhill. But we can also see that there still is considerable change that happens before a dementia diagnosis. In here, as we've discussed this morning, is the phase where we have an opportunity to intervene, to say, what can we do? How do we stop you, who are still on the left side here, from crossing over into a stage of severe cognitive decline? So today I'm gonna to kind of do a bird's eye view presentation of, of three relevant factors here. And, and William, I had no idea what William was going to present, but I will say you touched on a number of themes that I'll be touching on. So I think you will all pick up on some, some common themes in terms of key issues in aging research today and how we're trying to tackle them. So first, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what we understand about what drives loss of cognitive function as we as we age. In particular, I'll be talking about brain changes or disease processes that we're seeing develop in the older adult brain, including things like Alzheimer's disease, but also other aging-related brain changes, stroke, and a whole host of other things. Then, importantly, we're going to talk about protective factors. So what is it we can do to protect us as we age and how do these things work? Just a little bit of a touch on why we think some of these factors may actually provide protection. Then at the end, um, I'm gonna just briefly talk about some new approaches we're developing to identify older adults who might be at risk of cognitive decline way before we see any evidence of it. So again, this theme this morning we've pointed out is that we need to intervene way earlier in the cognitive aging trajectory if we're really to improve health outcomes. So we'll talk a little bit about how we may do that at the end. Uh, I am involved with NCHAP and it's a phenomenal study and you've seen a lot of research um, focusing on NCHAP this morning. Um, I also am at Rush University Medical Center and a lot of the work that I'll be showing you now comes from our aging cohort study. So these are large epidemiologic studies of aging that have been going on since the early 1990s. We study more than 4,000 older adults in the greater Chicago area. And importantly, all of our participants come into our studies without any cognitive impairment. So they're doing just fine. We evaluate them, they make sure, we make sure that they're in good shape. And we follow these individuals every year until they die. Every year we do detailed assessments of cognitive function, memory and other thinking abilities, as well as neurologic and physical examinations and behavioral and physical function testing. And all of this rich data comes together to let us see who goes throughout the aging process and performs well, what differentiates them from others who during their aging process develop cognitive syndromes, mild cognitive impairment, as well as dementia. And we also collect brain scans um, and other information about brain health. So an important component of our study is at the time of death, all of our participants have agreed to give us their brain. So we can look in their brain, quantify aging related diseases and begin to understand a, how those diseases have affected their performance over time, what their cognitive outcomes were, but B, how those diseases work with other factors, social, 
mental health factors, things we started talking about this morning, to allow some people to do well, maybe even despite brain aging. This is just showing you, uh, we do a very detailed cognitive assessment battery, including 20 uh, different tests that we can use to summarize overall cognitive function. We can also look at specific cognitive abilities like memory, language, and so on. And then in the brain, we measure, as I mentioned, a host of um, different brain changes. So on the top here, we actually take brain tissue and count how much of the Alzheimer's types of changes we see in the brain. So you all have probably heard of amyloid and tangles. These are the protein substances that character characterize Alzheimer's changes in the brain. And we know they disrupt the ability of the brain to function normally. We also see lots of evidence of stroke. So here's a little picture of essentially a hole in the brain where there's some, some swelling and inflammation, this light pink area around that hole that's showing us something went wrong in this area. Now this brain tissue is gone. So that person doesn't have that brain tissue anymore to work with and help their thinking. So when, to take a fairly basic view of cognitive uh, or aging brain changes that we see, when we compare normal brains, so a healthy older brain, we see that their brain tissue is thick, it's, it's, it's all connected together, their hippocampus, um, which Jay mentioned this morning is the area that controls memory, uh, is robust, it's thick, it looks good, it's in, it's in healthy shape. By comparison, when we look at the brain of an individual with Alzheimer's disease, we see that their brain has shrunken down. It's much smaller in size. They're losing tissue here around the what we call the cortex of the brain, and their hippocampus becomes smaller and smaller. And this is what drives their memory loss. Now, when we look at the various disease processes we can see in an aging brain, what we see is that Alzheimer's pathology disease changes there are extremely common. More than 85% of all older adults who die beyond the age of 80 have evidence of Alzheimer's changes in their brain. These are almost always present in people that come to us who have had dementia during their life. So if you have dementia, you have a significant burden of these Alzheimer's type changes. But importantly, these changes are also present among cognitively intact persons, as well as those with mild cognitive impairment. So it's not only when you actually have these dementia-related symptoms that you have these diseases. They're present in virtually everyone. Now, when we want to try to think about their impact on cognitive function, here what I'm showing you is the rate, this is just a, a general rate of cognitive decline over time for different groups of people. So this top line is for individuals who have no or very minimal disease pathology in their brain. You can see if we follow these people over about a decade or so, we don't really see much decline. There's a little bit of change there, but not much. And I, I posit that that little bit of change there is probably due to disease in the brain that we're not yet measuring, we don't really know about yet. By contrast, when we take the next line and we look at what the rate of changes for someone with Alzheimer's changes, we see that it's a considerably faster rate of decline. When we add strokes or other diseases, we see the rate of decline inc increases. So essentially from this picture, what we can take away is that the more disease pathology you have in your brain, the more your cognitive function declines as we age. But brain aging, as we were discussing earlier, is very complex. In fact, even cognitively intact people, those that never develop the dementia sy syndrome, tend to have at least three different diseases in their brain. So I'm mentioning Alzheimer's disease and strokes. These are the common ones that people know about, but there are a variety of other conditions that are very commonly found in the aging brain. And importantly, the effects of these diseases at an individual level vary depending on what the person's got and the characteristics of that person. So I could have minimal pathology and two certain types of it, but a lot of cognitive decline, whereas someone else can have a lot of pathology and three or four types of it and minimal decline. So this mismatch between what we see in the brain in terms of aging characteristics and how someone does 
suggests that people differ in terms of their ability to tolerate these aging-related brain changes. This is a concept we call resilience. There's something that allows some people to tolerate a lot of disease and yet still function well. And that's what we need to understand to really prevent cognitive disorders with advanced age. So this is just a little cartoon of Superman going, uh-oh, where, now where was I going? If we know that we're all going to develop some of these brain changes, no matter that it's gonna affect us differently, we need to know what, what actually counters the effects of those diseases, right? We need to find factors that can allow us to have those changes and somehow buffer them. I'm gonna talk about several of these today. And one of the most rewarding aspects of my research career is that I've been able to focus a lot on the role of psychological and lifestyle factors. As William mentioned, our biomedical disease models typically aren't interested in things that promote health or well being. They're interested more in predicting disease and negative health outcomes. What we're trying to do in the cognitive aging, brain aging space is turn this around and say, yeah, we know bad things are going to happen, but what can we do to prevent that? What can we do to help maintain function and support vitality as we age? Because we have the brain data that we have, we also want to understand how that works. So there's a few different ways lifestyle factors, for example, may help preserve our cognition as we age. They may have nothing to do with the disease pathology, but somehow provide you protection. So they're independent of the disease pathology, but maybe they make your brain faster, or a better computing power machine, or more efficient. On the flip side, they may somehow work with the pathology so that they allow you to accumulate pathology, but still function well. They modify how bad that pathology is for your cognitive function, or they may actually directly affect how much disease you get. So we know that, for example, cardiovascular health is an important predictor of whether somebody will have strokes as they get older. So there would be an, a direct association that, that those, those diseases may lead to brain aging effects. So the real question here is, what can we do to make ourselves have a stronger, more efficient, better brain as we age? Now, the idea that positive factors may have something to do with health outcomes is not a new idea. Although it has not received the attention in the medical literature, it should have, as we've discussed. Does anybody know who this is? No one. <laughs> this is a picture, and now when you hear the name, I'm sure several of you will recognize it, of Viktor Frankl. Does anybody know of Viktor Frankl? Yeah. <laughs> um, Victor Frank. Search for me. Exactly. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> Victor Frankel uh, was an Austri Austrian psychiatrist and survivor of uh, the Holocaust, who observed during his time in and shortly after the Holocaust that people who tended to not only survive but actually thrive both during their time in this horrific circumstance and after, were those who had something called a sense of purpose in life. They felt their lives were meaningful, goal-directed. They were intentional. They had a reason to go home. They had a why to live. And they were searching and struggling to do that, to get there, get back to those people and their roles in society. Frankel posited way back then that purpose in life likely would be predictive of, of health outcomes, that it would protect people from longer term bad things happening, maybe early mortality, things like that. But for 50 years, nobody in the medical community examined whether this was the case. Nobody looked at purpose in life. Why? Because mental health wasn't really what we were looking at when studying disease, right? We weren't thinking about this mind-body connection. So early in my career, we decided to test some of Viktor Frankl's hypotheses and looked at the relationship with a purpose in life with a variety of bad health outcomes in aging. We found that remarkably, purpose in life is associated with a significantly reduced risk of strokes as we get older, developing disability, the need for other people to help take care of us, hospitalizations, psychological outcomes, including depression, anxiety disorders, other sleep issues, 
as well as early mortality. Purpose in life is one of the most robust protectors of bad health outcomes that is out there in the literature. So of course, we wanted to know whether we could see a similar benefit with regard to cognitive function. So here, we're looking at the relationship of purpose in life with your likelihood of developing Alzheimer's dementia. So what we do here is we take people who start out with no dementia, no cognitive problems, we measure their purpose in life, and then we follow them over time and we see who develops dementia and what do they like, look like compared to the other group. Um, this top line here is uh, the risk of dementia for a person with low purpose in life. And a higher risk here is bad. It means they're much more likely to develop dementia. By contrast, someone with a high purpose in life was much more likely to remain free of dementia throughout their life. So it's a strong predictor of cognitive outcomes as well. We found the same association with mild cognitive impairment. Now, uh, this is a little bit of a tricky slide. I'll just point you to the important lines here. But when we think about how does purpose work, what does it does it work with pathology? Is it something separate from Alzheimer's changes in the brain, for example? How does it work? What we show here is how um, individuals with a lot of pathology with high ver high purpose versus low purpose purpose decline. So just focus on these two bottom lines for the moment. All these people have a lot of disease in their brain, but the top line has a high degree of purpose, bottom line, low degree of purpose. And you can see right here yourselves that those with a high purpose had a considerably slower rate of decline by more than 30% over the course of their aging. So having that sense of purpose provided them robust protection against both developing the clinical syndrome of dementia, but also the overall amount of cognitive decline they experienced. The other option, another option is that we may see that these things like purpose in life can directly affect how much pathology you accumulate. So we, in another study, we looked at the relationship of purpose in life with the risk of having a stroke in your brain when, when you come to autopsy. And we found that people with a high purpose in life had almost a 50% lower risk of having strokes in their brain. So on the one hand, purpose in life somehow providing you protection in the face of Alzheimer's changes, but on the other hand, purpose in life is reducing your risk of actually developing strokes. So it's having two different types of effect to protect us. This strongly suggests that behavioral and psychological interventions that focus on purpose in life might really help reduce the harmful effects of brain aging. Similarly, we can think of purpose in life in terms of its effect to delay bad health outcomes as we age. When we look at things in a different way using another type of modeling, what we see is that purpose in life can delay the onset of dementia by almost six years. Now, the average age of dementia onset is over the age of 80, okay? So if we delay dementia onset by six years, a sizable number of people will never actually go on to develop dementia. This is how potent some of these types of behaviors can be in terms of their protective effects. Another factor that you may have heard about in, in the news, it's, it's commonly talked about is this idea of an intellectual stimulation or cognitive activity. So doing things like reading, playing games, you know, learning new things, a new foreign language, for example, um, getting out there. When we look at cognitive activity with the likelihood of developing uh, Alzheimer's disease, again, we see that that this pointer is a little difficult. Then we see for a low active person, they're very highly likely to develop dementia, whereas a cognitively active person is much less likely to develop dementia. Again, just being engaged, just being stimulated is strongly protective against your risk of adverse cognitive outcomes. When we look at cognitive activity and how that works, we see something a little bit different with the, than we do with purpose. It's not allowing you to accumulate the, the disease, but somehow uh, not having that disease really have an effect on you, but it's separately related to your rate of cognitive change. It's doing something different. So here you see 
the rate of cognitive change for someone who's very engaged in cognitive activity late in life compared to someone who's moderately or not very much engaged in cognitive activity. Again, you see this difference in the, in the rate of cognitive decline pretty clearly, right? So someone who is mentally very active is declining a lot less, more than 25% less over the course of this study than someone who's not cognitively active. Interestingly, we know that some of these behavioral factors might affect you even if they're done earlier in the life course. Of course, wellness and health do not begin in aging. They begin at birth. When we look at the effects of early life cognitive activity, we see the same thing. So someone who is active, engaged, being stimulated as a child does a lot better as they age. Early and late life co cognitive activities have separate and additive effects. So what we need to do is be engaging in these protective behaviors both early in the life course and then later as we're facing the burden of brain aging. What else has been identified? I've given you some exemplars, but we've found a whole host of other factors that we see are protective against late life cognitive and often other health outcomes. Uh, early life factors, including things like education, uh, music or foreign language instruction, socioeconomic factors like having more financial resources. These are very protective later in life. These findings have important implications for policy efforts. We need to make sure that more individuals have better access to educational and other resources early in life. Why? We're going to improve health outcomes across the lifespan. In terms of late life, there's a whole host of factors we can do. Social activity is very important here. Uh, the NCHAP study has done a lot of work in this regard. We know that having positive social relationships, having more frequent social interactions are protective against a whole range of health outcomes. The same is true with cognition. Similarly, positive affect and mood. So by this, I mean increasing happiness, increasing optimism, but also decreasing negative mental health factors like depression. All of these things can help protect us as we age. Um, there's other factors. Life space is this idea of how much do you get out and about in the world? Do you leave your house? Do you leave your neighborhood? Do you travel to other places? Exposure to the world is extremely protective against cognitive decline. Similarly, we've heard some this morning about diet and the importance of having a heart healthy <laughs> diet of, uh, is, is it's clearly related to our brain aging process and managing cardiovascular risk factors, managing heart health. So to conclude so far, what we see is that there are many psychological and lifestyle factors that are protective against cognitive decline that promote healthy cognitive aging. These things protect us even as we develop these diseases, we know we're gonna develop as we age. So they're doing something separate for us. They're providing us this level of protection and resilience. And importantly, most of these factors that we've identified are modifiable. There's a lot we can do in terms of social engagement, improving mental health and wellness. But we need more focus on this. Again, the medical community hearkening back to William's talk is not adequately focused on improving mental and lifestyle behaviors in the ways that we need to, to actually promote health and promote lifespan that is living well throughout your life and being functional, being vital, even as we age. So this work really does provide an opportunity for us to think about novel prevention strategies and therapeutic targets. What should we be doing? How do we teach kids and high schoolers and young adults to find their purpose in life? How do we help older adults redefine their roles and figure out ways to increase their connection with others, increase their engagement in activities are, that are important to them? These are the challenges that we really need to tackle. And these are challenges that if we do tackle, we'll have major public health and economic benefit. So what are the other implications here for healthy cognitive aging? I mentioned to you that when we look at purpose in life, we see that purpose in life can delay dementia onset by about six years, which is impressive. Cognitive activity separately can delay dementia onset by more than five years. Think about if we had a combined intervention 
that included a purpose focus and a cognitive activity focus. What if we could prevent dementia by 10 years? Some people say that more than half of all dementia cases could be eliminated with interventions that target these things. We need trials to show this. We need more work to show this. But combined and earlier life interventions could certainly change the field of cognitive aging and certainly protect many more of us from, from the brain changes that we know we're going to face. OK, so turning real quickly, the, my final leg here, to another challenge that we brought up this morning, which is this idea that we know if we can intervene with people before they start having any cognitive problems, before they develop mild symptoms, and certainly before they develop dementia, we have the best shot at improving their health outcomes. This is a challenge in the field because we don't know who is at risk and who isn't. We can look at the medical factors that people mentioned this morning, diabetes and things like that, that we know are related to cognitive outcomes, but we still don't really know at an individual level who is likely to experience cognitive decline. So one of the things that we've been interested in studying in, in recent years, and again, this gets back to William's talk, is this idea about decision-making. Um, decision-making, as you all know, is the ability to generate, process, and evaluate multiple alternatives and choose an optimal behavior or choice. Everything we do throughout lifespan involves some form of decision making, whether it's what to have for lunch, healthy meal or a burger and fries, how to spend your invest your paycheck, spend it, what to do with your financial situation. And of course, all of these decisions are important across the lifespan. They predict success in occupation, they predict wealth, they predict health behaviors and outcomes, but they're critical, particularly in aging. Older adults are facing many complex financial and healthcare decisions in particular. And these are emotional decisions that oftentimes older adults have no prior experience with. When you're deciding on end of life care, this is the first time older adults, people have thought of these issues and are, are really confronted with how bad is this treatment going to be? How long do I have with it, without it? What's the right decision here? These are novel decisions and highly stressful decisions. Similarly, they're making a lot of financial uh, decisions that, again, novel, and people are not well prepared for these types of decisions. And all of this is happening in the context of brain and cognitive aging and in the context of diminishing resources. Older people are not often in the workforce, so don't have opportunities to recover from financial and other mistakes. A particularly salient example of some of the challenges we see old, older people in the real world facing with decision-making is the issue of elder fraud. Older persons are more vulnerable than younger persons to fraud. Um, and it's estimated that losses to elder fraud may exceed $30 billion a year annually in the US alone. This is a huge issue. Surprisingly, many older adult victims don't have dementia. Some don't have any cognitive impairment or disability. Many are college educated. They're still active in the community. They're still engaged. Why? Why? So our, our thinking, when we were thinking about how ways to find signs that somebody is likely to develop cognitive decline is that maybe this complex behavior of decision-making where we're seeing people struggle is an early sign that something is going wrong. Decision-making is difficult. It involves not only cognitive ability, but social abilities, understanding if you can trust somebody who's presenting you with a certain investment option, for example. It involves emotional regulation. Will I take the time to think through this decision or do I just make an impulsive decision? There's a lot going on when we think about decision-making. So maybe it's vulnerable to those aging-related brain changes and maybe we can see changes in decision-making before we see cognitive factors, this cognitive decline. Finally, if, if we can use this to identify people who are at risk of cognitive aging and cognitive decline, can we see what we can do to help them? Because again, we're moving earlier and earlier in the spectrum. This is gonna allow us to have downstream protective effects on cognition. 
I'm going to skip this. I was going to show you how we measure decision making, but in, I'd like us to have some time for discussion at the end. So we can come back to that if you'd like. But but we do a series of performance tests to measure how people do things like make mutual fund choices or healthcare plan choices, and we see how they behave on those. When we look at decision making with adverse health outcomes, so here we are looking at, oh, sorry, we're looking at uh, the relationship of decision making with death. Again, we take people who don't have any cognitive problems to start with and we measure their decision-making. Then we follow them over time, document who develops cognitive impairment and dementia. And we see that someone who's a poor decision-maker up here is more than four times more likely to, to die over a four-year follow-up period compared to someone who's a good decision-maker down here. Over four years of follow-up. This is a very strong predictor that adverse health outcomes are, are imminent. Similarly, if we look at decision-making with cognitive outcomes, on the left, we look here at the association with Alzheimer's dementia. Again, a poor decision-maker is much more likely to develop Alzheimer's dementia compared to a good decision-maker. For this mild cognitive impairment syndrome, same thing. Again, it's an extremely strong sign that something is going amiss when we see that someone is struggling, starting to struggle with these financial and healthcare decisions. Similarly, we talked about this problem of, of fraud. Um, one of the things that we measure is how susceptible someone might be to scams or fraud. So we ask them questions like, how often do you answer the phone when it rings and you don't know who's calling? The cardinal rule of not being victimized is don't answer the phone when you don't know who's calling. About 70% of our older adults answer the phone when they don't know who's calling. How likely are you to talk to someone when you don't want to? You have the sense on the phone that this person is nefarious. About 45% of our older adults say they can't get off the phone in those situations. They're polite. They want to be respectful. They're vulnerable. When we look at scam susceptibility with the risk of cognitive outcomes for dementia, again, we see that those who are vulnerable, top line, are much more likely to develop Alzheimer's dementia and similarly mild cognitive impairment. Again, changes in your judgment, changes in your ability to start thinking through these complex things are an early indicator of adverse cognitive outcomes. We can, we can account for how well someone was doing cognitively throughout the study and still see that these factors are predictive of adverse cognitive health outcomes. Now, when we think about this, what does it mean? Why are we seeing that older people are having trouble with decisions? Is this a longstanding effect? Maybe they just weren't as good as younger people are today, ever? You know, so they are just not good at these types of things for demographic reasons or who knows what? Or is it that something is actually going on here? When we look at decision-making change over time, so similar to what I showed you earlier with cognition, and we look at just individuals' lines over time. Again, we see that decision-making is changing a lot with age. On average, there's a decline here. But like cognition, there's a lot of heterogeneity. Some people start out well and stay well. Some people start out okay, but decline slowly. Others tank. And then everything in the middle. So it looks very much like cognition, but we see these changes years before we can see this kind of change in the cognitive space. What helps? Can we do something to protect at this earlier phase? Interestingly, when we look at the kinds of factors that I was talking with you about in the cognitive space, we see that similar factors protect, to protect against aging-related deficits with decision-making. So purpose in life, again, a very protective factor for decision-making. Positive affect, social engagement, the absence of loneliness, the having of good relationships, cognitive engagement. But then we also see there are some different factors that are protective in this, in this domain, decision-making. For example, older adults who use technology, they get on the internet, they use a cell phone, 
those individuals are less likely to have decision-making problems and less likely to decline over time. So access to resources and being willing to go out and interact with those resources are protective against these early changes in decision-making. What are the implications of this? The main finding here, uh, the main implication here is that poor decision-making appears to be a very early indicator of bad health outcomes to come, including cognitive decline and dementia, but also mortality. And we've also shown other association with health outcomes, hospitalization, and so on. So this suggests that looking at decision-making and thinking more about decision-making in old age may really help us to identify people who are at higher risk of having cognitive decline and impairment before we can detect any of this on a cognitive test. That's when we can intervene with these people. And again, these same psychological and lifestyle factors matter and some new ones, meaning we can move our interventions back up when we see that the sign there's a sign that somebody is going on a downward trajectory. There are some things we can do before they start showing any cognitive decline and before they make decisions that are gonna really have bad health implications for them. Fraud, being a victim of fraud is, is very bad for health and often associated with early mortality, depression, suicide, and so on. But there's something that we can do if we back this process up and we intervene earlier with these people. So big picture conclusions here are that Brain aging is a major determinant of cognitive and also other functional change in old age, decision-making and, and likely other behaviors that we have yet to really study in good detail. But brain aging isn't the whole story. There's a whole bunch of modifiable factors that are also important, <laughs> contribute to cognitive aging and can buffer the effects of Alzheimer's changes, strokes in the brain, other aging-related brain changes. Um, this is suggesting that we need to hone in on these new treatment targets. Um, and also that if we improve decision making, we likely will have downstream effects on cognitive function because we know it's earlier in the course of aging. So we all need a nudge sometimes. <laughs> and I hope with this presentation that I've given you a little bit of a nudge to, to get out there understanding that an active and engaged lifestyle is really the best thing you can do right now to protect against aging related cognitive decline and the big three that we are covering here on a broader level today are the ones we're thinking about cognitive activity social activity physical activity but mental health more generally is also key minimizing negative factors depression anxiety the like and optimizing positive factors positive affect, happiness, feeling connected, and purpose in life. I can't say enough of all of these indicators. It is the strongest and most robust protective factor. So find your purpose. And thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to have some time for questions, but I need um, a reminder. When are we... Supposed to be wrapping this up. Um, you have probably about twelve minutes. Twelve minutes. Okay. Questions. I have two. James. Sure. sure. So there's this like I'm not a scientist or how to manage this, but there was a slogan that a long time ago that it's kind of makes me think of, and it is thinking is not in the head. And I, and the person brought this up and he took an example of like something called galvanic skin response. Oh. I don't know about other children, but it was news to me. The idea, of like, you know, if you're given the task to sort thing, if you reach for it, your body actually starts to sweat a little, if it's the wrong decision, you notice it and it helps you make the right decision. But if I keep my body healthier, it's one of the things that happens is that my body can actually respond to these signals give me a gut reaction and I can actually make the right decision. Process that. Yeah. So the, the galvanic skin response is, is measuring a stress reaction. Um, you want to quickly restate that question? Okay. Um, uh, simply put, well, I simply <laughs> restate this question. Simply put, are you going to go ahead? Well, I was just going to say, are, 
the galvanic skin response to the extent it's an indicator of your body's wisdom does does your ability to detect your your gut you might say um is it maintained longer if you're in cognitive good health and does it well, you lose that does it protect you when you're does it protect you? the situation well, if i have a healthier body right. my heart is healthier and my brain says hey this looks fishy your yeah. heart better start beating faster and that is the signal back to my brain to say, oh, we should get ready to run. I need to get out of this situation. Yeah. If I have a healthy heart, do I have louder gut feelings? <laughs> that we say? That's, uh, that's an interesting question that I'm not sure we have clear science on. Um, but there is, there is evidence that a healthier physiologic state in conjunction, and this is an important point, with a healthier psychological state does allow people to process stressful circumstances more effectively and then make better decisions. So if you're confronted with a stressor or a decision point, you don't know what to do, and you come into this situation full of anxiety you know, and distress, you are still not very likely to make a good decision because that mental piece is there. So it's always a combination of body and mind, mind meaning mental health mind as well as brain health you know all of these factors are playing in we, we never want to let you know too much damage on one end force us into a situation where we're going to be making suboptimal decisions because that one component isn't working that's the importance of understanding the balance between mental health and physical health so you know on the flip side if they show people who are in a positive mood sometimes you can manipulate mood by showing people certain stimuli something scary versus like a cuddly friendly animal you know and then have them do a stressful uh test when you've shown them the cuddly ad animal they're in a better state of mind and make better choices then those things interact with your physical health to influence your decisions. So again, I think it's a, it's a combination of body and mind, holistic mind. Linda. Can you tell us more about purpose in life, how it's measured, how you determine sure. it, if there's a range or if there's a yes or no, and are there interventions? Okay, um, so so the question is, how do we measure purpose in life and are there interventions to improve it? Um, so we measure purpose with a with a multi item questionnaire where we ask people things like, um, do you set goals and try to work them toward a reality? Do you feel like you're intentional about how you spend your time? Um, do you feel that there's meaning in your everyday activities? So a range of questions to get at how much they feel they're they're focused and also intentional and and connected in general um we do see a range of that there's there we have people that are are highly purposeful and then we have people who are very low in terms of that dimension but people in the middle and, and in the middle yeah everything everything in the middle um so so that's how we're able to sort of separate and is it a linear relationship so even a small improvement in the middle of the range is better, or is it only if you have high purpose in life? No, a small improvement in the middle of the range is, is also useful. Any improvement, we've looked, we've tried to sort of disentangle that a little bit, but any improvement in purpose in life, a lot of times when we talk about purpose in life, people say, well, but I don't know how to get that. And it's sort of a trait thing, you either have it or you don't. And so what, like, what am I going to do to change this, to change my health outcomes? Minimal changes in purpose are meaningful for their effect on health outcomes. And I'm not an interventionist, but from the broader literature, um, there are several studies suggesting that interventions to improve purpose can be effective. Um, so things like mindfulness interventions, where you, you teach people how to focus on certain things that are important goals, they may want to establish being aware of how their behaviors either move them toward that goal, away from that goal. Those things can change purpose, um, as well as cognitive behavioral interventions, motivational interviewing as well. We can do things to kind of help people think about, are they doing what they want to do you know, with their time? Time is our most limited and precious resource. Are we thoughtful about 
how we spend our day. Are we actually working toward things we want to be, or are we going through the motions of your daily life? You know, so there are things we can do to influence these things. And another relevant point, I think, Linda, is that um, it's important to know that having purpose in life doesn't mean you know you're going to run this volunteer organization that's going to change the world. Right. So purpose is a very individual construct for one person that can say, I want to see my grandkid once a week. And that's the thing that brings me joy, brings me connection, makes me feel like I'm affecting the younger generation, whatever it is for that person. Or purpose can be something much more broad. I think an important thing we need to think about with interventions and also the way we talk about these things is that. We need people to know we don't need major shifts in these things. We need small improvements. And those small improvements can have multiple outputs: talking stroke, disability, hospitalization, dementia. You know, I think improving these things on a small scale and maybe improving two or three of them simultaneously can have major health benefits. Great counsel. Thank you. <laughs> For one more, can we decide, please? Um, go for it. Okay, uh, do you have any evidence about what are people that have cognitive problems when they're young, or people that have ADD, uh, or dyslexia, uh -huh. or any literature about that? Or yeah, that? and how they yeah. fare. How, is there any, how that plays out? Yes, so um, cognitive limitations earlier in life are related to cognitive outcomes. So, um, so there is some evidence, not great evidence, but what you start out with is related to kind of where you end up. So- Yeah, well, that's kind of truism. Right, it is a truism, that we see it in- it's a, Because there are people with ADD can be very intelligent. Right. No, no. Right. Right. It, there's always this heterogeneity. You know, there's always people who have something but don't ever show the symptoms of it. In general, um, starting out with a with a, a lower cognitive function, a particular area like attention. No, because you're, you see, you're making an assumption when you're saying ADD, you're assuming that the person is functioning at a lower level. Oh, that right. That is true. But uh, yeah, so uh, I guess then I think that there's a variety of outcomes. There is some evidence, though, that having those types of developmental um, of challenges does have negative impacts in the. You know, I think this stuff is all over. Yeah. It's all over. The yeah. Place, for example, you're saying bad. How are you defining a bad decision? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, lower than the average, you know, we can do cutoffs and things like that. So it's a normative concept. Kind, well, you know, you could call it that, but yeah, we have a range like. I'm, I'm trying to understand what, what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, perhaps we could talk at the break. I mean, it's okay. it's sort of hard to give all the details in this kind of a presentation, but yeah, we do have cutoffs we use for. Yeah, yeah we can pursue this. Um, I think we're supposed to be taking a break right about that. Thank you.